Hello and welcome to Cosmology Corner, the show where I answer your questions about space and astronomy. We have a question from Dan C who asks, how does our sun compare to most other stars in the known universe in terms of brightness, size, chemical composition, age, etc.? I'm gonna have to keep my tablet for this one because there's a lot of numbers here. So first of all, as we've talked about multiple times, we know that blue stars, big blue stars, they have a shorter life, they have a violent life and they die young. Whereas small red stars, they have a longer life and stars, depending on their size, is of course divided or classified into, uh, into letters where the heaviest one is called O stars, then it is B, A, F, G, K and M stars. And where M stars, of course, is the, um, the smallest and reddest star that we would uh, classify as a main sequence star. There are brown dwarfs and other types and we're not going to go outside the main branch, but that is just the, the, the main sequence stars. Now, O-type stars, the big, the heavy blue ones, as they live very, uh, very short life and then fewer of them form. There are also very few of them um, in general. There is 0.0003% um, of O-type stars. Then we go to B-type stars, which is 0.13%. A-type is 0.6%. F-type is 3%. And then G-type, which is the type that the sun is, is 7.6%. So summing that up, we get um, just over like 10%, 11% or something like that. So in terms of mass, the sun is about in the top 11% of uh, of stars in terms of age um stars of this age live about 10 billion years and we believe the sun is around 4 billion years so it's ish halfway through its lifespan so again it's pretty average uh average on that so in short the sun is a pretty average star about halfway through its life cycle and it's in the slightly heavier end compared at least to the average mass of stars out there the next question comes to us from G.V. Chesnu, and he asks, are black holes important for the formation of galaxies since there seems to be massive black holes at the center of the visible galaxies? Now to answer that, we need to head back to the very early stages of the universe, where we don't really have a lot of stars, but we just have a lot of gas spread out everywhere. And the gas begins to clump together and we begin to see some of the, some of the first stars. And it is believed that some of these first, uh, very early stars was very, very big, probably way bigger than anything we see today. Which also meant that they would have lived a very short life and they would very, very quickly have gone over and would have left behind a sizable black hole. But as this gas clumps together, we have more and more stars that are being formed uh, in those regions and we have these um, star clusters. But as these big heavy stars, they, they turn into uh, to black holes, they trigger, um, they trigger more star formation and stars begin to form in these areas. And we don't really have a clear cut line between when we, we distinguish something as a, as a cluster of stars and when it turns over to be a galaxy. The line there is a little fuzzy. Um, but in, in theory, yes, so black holes, they do have an effect on, um, on the formation of galaxies, but it is very difficult to determine the life of a galaxy. How does galaxies evolve? And the best way I can explain it is, imagine that you took a snapshot of, of the Earth and you knew nothing about human, and you had the Earth which is frozen in time, and you were free to explore, every corner of the earth and look at all the different humans that were all frozen in time but you would now have to go and try to figure out how human life evolves from this frozen in time snapshot so you're gonna have to try and figure out oh that human is probably older than that human and well, different areas of the planet and you can imagine that would be a very difficult task to do so while we do have some theories about how galaxies evolve over time and we kind of can get some indications of the age of a galaxy based on its redshift, so we do have some clues to the life of a galaxy and how it evolves, um, but it is believed that supermassive black holes, or at least a, a sizable black hole, is kind of the seed that begins to form that star cluster that then eventually at some point becomes big enough that we would classify it as an elliptical galaxy and those elliptical galaxies will then um, slowly begin to flatten out and we will get these more um, disc-shaped uh, galaxies as we see with the, with the Milky Way and Andromeda and, and many of the other galaxies. We have one here from Dan C. When I look up in the night sky and pick out a star, what is the right tools and how do I use them to find out what the star name is? 
One of my favorite apps for this um, is an app called Stellarium. Um, originally, it was actually um, a desktop thing, like an interactive star map. It's since been moved over to, to smartphones as well. It's free, and I think it's, it's a wonderful app. Uh, it uses the phone's um, like uh, gyro and its compass to kind of give you a star map in the approximate direction you're, you're uh, pointing the phone. It's not always super accurate, but it's close enough that you can find the, a specific star if you're looking at it. And I find the best way to go by it is often to find an easy recognizable um, structure in the night sky. That could be Orion's belt, it could be the North Star, whatever you are, you, you can easily detect. And then use, um, use that to kind of say, okay, so if that is, if that is Orion's belt, then that is Kashupaya, then that is the North Star, and you can kind of move um, walk through the night sky until you get to the star you're interested in uh, in looking at. But again, you can just point your phone in the approximate direction and it will give you um, the part of the, of the star map. Wonderful tool, highly recommend it. We have one here from Daniel Thomas. He says, I understand how black holes come to life and what trigger them, etc. But I've always wondered if black holes like stars ever die. Yes, black holes can, can absolutely die. They can actually evaporate. But in order to explain how, um, I need to give you a crash course in quantum field theory. Now, in quantum field theory, one of the things that can happen is you can have a particle and an antiparticle. That could be matter or antimatter or a photon and an antiphoton that could just spontaneously exist or be, like, be, be created. But and, and, and in quantum field theory, that should happen all the time, everywhere. But they will be created right in so close proximity to each other that they will immediately um, I collapse together and, uh, and, and annihilate each other and disappear. So now imagine we have a black hole and right at the event horizon of the black hole we have this particle and this antiparticle suddenly just exists. But one of them is created just outside the black hole and one of them is created just inside of it. So in this situation the two particles won't be able to collide with each other again and annihilate each other. One is going to be sucked into the black hole, the other one is going to be able to escape. That amount of energy that escapes, well, it has to come from somewhere. That comes from the mass of the black hole. So a little bit of mass disappears in the black hole. It creates these two um, uh, particles, antiparticle sets. They would usually just collapse back, maybe into matter, maybe into some other type of energy. But in this situation, half of it disappears out of the black hole while the other thing falls back in. That is called Hawking's radiation from Stephen Hawking, who was the one who, who theorized this. And because that energy loss, we all know the famous equation, Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared, meaning that when some energy disappears, well, energy and matter can just basically be freely transformed between each other. Energy is just, matter is just another form of energy like heat or light. So when that energy disappears, it will like, dig away at the uh, at the mass of the black hole and will slowly begin to shrink. Now, the interesting thing is that this effect, for some reason, is faster the smaller the black hole is. That means when you have these supermassive black holes, this is like this Hawking radiation should be relatively low. As the black holes get smaller, it increases. So that means as they begin to evaporate, they will evaporate quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker until they completely disappear. This is also why when you hear these like news article that somewhere in CERN or whatever, they're now crashing things together and they're creating miniature black holes. And it's like, it don't worry, it's not going to be like sucking up the whole earth and we're going to disappear into a black hole because these black holes are so tiny that the Hawking radiation from them is going to make them evaporate in nanoseconds. They're going to be gone in no time at all and not going to cause any kind of real danger at all. So, um, so that's how black holes die. They evaporate through Hawking's radiation. Okay, we have a very technical one here from Eric who says, if the Milky Way is moving at 600,000 meters a second, could we launch something near the speed of light in the opposite direction, making it go faster than the speed of light from our perspective? We're going to use, instead of the galaxies, just use spaceships. Let's imagine that you're sitting in a spaceship and you're observing another spaceship flying to the side at half the speed of light. That spaceship then launches something in the opposite direction at the speed of light. Could be a laser pulse or whatever. Now, the relative speed between the two, from you as the observer's point of view, will be 
one and a half times the speed of light. I mean, it's the same thing if you have a light bulb, you turn it on, it will send photons out in either direction, and the relative speed between those two photons will, from you as an observer, be um, two times the speed of light. But no single object is moving faster than the speed of light. And that's the important thing to, to remember here. But yes, from a observer's point of view, they will have a relative speed to each other that is faster than the speed of light. But what happens from the person then inside the spacecraft shooting out that laser pulse? Well, for him, he will also see the laser pulse move away from him, not at one and a half times the speed of light, but at the speed of light. I might think, how can that be? How can one looking at it from the outside say you have a relative speed that's one and a half times the speed of light, but the person inside the spacecraft says, no, I have one times the speed of light. And that's because time dilation, which of course was made famous mainly from, uh, from interstellar, but not only big gravitational wells cause time dilation, moving fast also causes time dilation. So the fact that you're moving causes time to um, uh, causes this, this time dilation. And because we can no longer agree at which pace time is progressing, that of course also means that we no longer agree at which speed things are necessarily moving. So not only that, we also have what's called like length contraction where things moving faster is gonna look like there's gonna be contracted in their direction of travel. It's gonna be like pancaked. At least it looks like it. The, the, the guy moving itself doesn't feel it, but the observer sees it. So not only can't we agree on distance, we can't agree on, the, on how fast time is progressing. And because of that, uh, you can't get a constant speed of light. I know this is super complicated. Special relativity is really hard to wrap your head around. And it's probably complicated enough that it could, I could dedicate its own video to it, which I probably will at some point because it is a complicated topic, but it's a super interesting topic when you get your head wrapped around it. But as I said, it is complicated. But for now, the, the, the short answer is when things begin to move at relativistic speeds, we can no longer agree on the progress of time. We can no longer agree on what uh, a standard length is. And therefore, that is the thing that gives in order for us to get that constant, um, that constant speed of light. If you would like to have your questions answered in a future episode of Cosmology Corner, then do post them in the comment section below and who knows, I might pick them up. What would often describe as the surface is what's actually called the chromosphere. This is where well, light and color from the star comes from. But there are layers above, which is described as the star's atmosphere, even though it's not an atmosphere in the same sense as we have on planets. 